Back when processing power in computers was so limited, artists and engineers found unique ways to overcome obstacles and deliver images and animations no one ever thought was possible. In this video, I'm going to cover one of those neat little tricks, and that is color cycling. Color cycling is a really simple concept. It just involves swapping one color of an image with another. That doesn't sound so exciting, right? You're in for a surprise though, because what people manage to do with this simple trick is quite amazing. Color cycling in the 80s and 90s was quite important because system resources were very limited. With this method, artists could create full screen animations by using a fraction of the storage space a video file would use. Back then, everything had to fit in 720 kilobyte floppy disks and half to 2 megabytes of RAM, so video files weren't so practical. But even if videos could be stored in that sort of space, the limited CPU power would make full screen videos quite difficult to play back. Color cycling solved this issue because it required almost no CPU cycles, freeing the processor to deal with other important things. Now, in order for color cycling to work, there was one more key ingredient. Indexed color. Digital images are made out of pixels. Each pixel gets assigned an RGB value, but with indexed color, things are slightly different. Each pixel is assigned an index that references a palette stored alongside the image. Let's see how that works in Photoshop. Here, I can convert this render to index color by just switching from RGB to index color. I'll use a 16 color palette. By going to color table, we see all the colors available in the image. So in position 1, we have black, in position 2, we have white, and so on and so forth. So if I select a color and change it, the change will be applied to all pixels with that index value. Let's load up a completely new palette that has different colors than the ones we use now. As you can see, we can make big changes to the image just by changing the colors. With color cycling, we're taking advantage of that so we can constantly swap one color with another in order to create the illusion of movement. One of the earliest, most successful examples of color cycling was Amiga's Boeing demo. The demo was relatively simple and it showed a rotating ball bouncing around on the screen. There were other tricks involved other than color cycling in this demo, but the rotation of the ball was achieved through color cycling. Even though it looks like the ball is a 3D geometry rotating around its axis, it's actually not. It's just a 32 color palette cycling through red and white. As you can see, most of the colors are reserved for red and white. Only four colors remain static, the gray background, the shadow of the ball, and the grid colors. A tutorial video from back in the day describes exactly how this effect can be achieved in Deluxe Paint. Deluxe Paint was the go-to program for most artists and the gold standard for the gaming industry of the time. The first step is to define the color palette for cycling along with the desired cycling speed. Then the white and red colored grid are created by stamping first a rectangle with the two colors and then whole rows. Then by using a color fill mode that conforms to whatever shape the user draws, the effect of perspective is created. By the way, this uh, shape conforming gradient is something that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore in modern uh, graphics programs. But I digress. So now that the red and white rectangles are ready, all the user needs to do is enable cycling and the effect is complete. As artists began to understand how to use the effect, we started seeing color cycling used in all sorts of ways. Here, for example, we have an early showcase of uh, color cycling in Deluxe Paint. In this case, color cycling works as an infographic tool to show how an artificial and natural hard work. From another Mega software of the time, Graphicraft, we can see another effective demo of color cycling. A rabbit and a bird move effortlessly from one side of the screen to the other, complete with water reflections. 
From the same software, we can see that color cycling is quite effective for weather maps as well. Where things got interesting was when games started using color cycling. Here we have the title screen of Defender of the Crown using color cycling quite effectively. I remember being amazed by the visuals of this game back in the day. Throughout the game, color cycling was used quite a lot to render water and fire effects. Color cycling can work really well for these kind of things, and as a matter of fact, it was used for that reason and lots of other games of the time. For example, in Ports of Call, the water effects are done with color cycling. The same goes for the unreleased 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. As the developers and artists got more familiar with the effect, we started seeing more elaborate use cases. One of those brilliant use cases we can find in the Sega Genesis and SNES game Mickey Mania. There was a level where Mickey was being chased by a moose in a 3D looking environment. The trees left and right were just an animation playing back, but the rotating floor was created with color cycling by changing colors on one pixel lines on a cylindrical type of pattern. The result is something that wasn't seen before on such a simple hardware as the Mega Drive or Super NES. You can see how the effect was done in more detail in Game Hut's video here on YouTube. I'll have the link in the description below. If you want to see how developers back then managed to make limited hardware do things it was never supposed to do, Game Hut's channel is a must watch. The man though who elevated color cycling to a whole new level was Mark Ferrari, an artist who worked on backgrounds on a lot of LucasArts games and most recently did the backgrounds for Thimbleweed Park. His color cycling images are just mind-blowingly amazing. Not only did he manage to create beautiful atmospheric effects just by cycling colors, but he managed to also do that while recreating 24-hour light changes. He even managed to create varying speeds of animation in the same image just by using fewer or more colors on a gradient. Depending on the area, the gradient covers, and the number of colors that need to cycle through, things would seem to move slower or faster. The amount of artistry in these images is just through the roof. Just as a reminder, there are no animation frames here, it's just colors cycling through. Again, you need to see and experience these firsthand, so I will leave the link with all of these images in the description below. If you also want to hear how Mark Ferrari worked, you absolutely need to watch his incredible GDC presentation, which I will also leave in the description below. Color cycling though wasn't just reserved on games and Amiga-centric software. It could be seen throughout different platforms. There are a lot of examples on the Atari computers and PCs. For example, Windows used it in the 90s on the boot screen to indicate OS loading. But as you can imagine, the more powerful the hardware got, the less important it was to rely on these kind of tricks. The most recent example where we can see color cycling is in Shovel Knight, where the developer of the game tried to remain as faithful as possible to the limitations of the 8 and 16-bit era. Every time an enemy gets hit, a color cycling effect is triggered. It's not as elegant as other examples mentioned before, but it is noteworthy that Yacht Club games went through the trouble to use that effect even though they could have went a completely different route. Nowadays, there's not a lot of software that can achieve that effect, mainly because there's no reason for the effect to be used. The simplest hardware nowadays is several times faster than any powerful system back then, so the need for these CPU and memory saving tricks are not really needed. ProMotion, which is a pixel art software from Cosmigo, is one of the few tools nowadays that can still produce these type of effects. To this day, I'm amazed by how much developers and artists achieved with this simple trick so it's a bit of a shame that we don't see more of these beautiful exercises in restraint and ingenuity, but I think we will probably see some good uses of the effect the more people dive into 8-bit type of artwork. And that's about it for this video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit the like button and also consider subscribing to the channel. Take care and I'll see you on the next one.